uh, what we'll do today is we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, uh, some of the presentations of insomnia, diagnostic aspects. We'll also talk a little, a little bit about a case, and finally we'll talk about therapeutics. So these are our disclosures. Uh, please refer to them in the handouts as well. And the faculty have been informed of the responsibility to disclose to the audience. Uh, they'll be discussing off-label investigational uses of drugs and products. Um, and uh, this has been independently reviewed. And we will give brand names at times, but we'll also make sure that we give you the uh, generic names as well. Uh, these are learning objectives. Uh, we would like to recognize the link between insomnia, comorbid mental health conditions, and co-management challenges. We'll also be discussing strategies to improve the identification and monitoring of insomnia, uh, symptoms among mental health patients. We'll, we'll talk about the current standard of care in insomnia and patient-specific considerations that drive pharmacotherapy. And finally, we're going to be evaluating clinical evidence surrounding emerging insomnia therapies and pharmacotherapeutic strategies for informed integration into therapeutic decision making. So basically, what's coming down the pike? So uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the um, recognition of the link between insomnia, comorbid mental health conditions, and resultant co-management challenges. First of all, we'll start with the case of Anna. Anna is a patient uh, who is a 29-year-old woman with persistent sleep difficulty for two years. She's had problems with sleep for two years. Uh, she goes to bed at about 10 most nights, having difficulty falling asleep, can't fall asleep quickly enough. She has multiple awakenings afterwards every night by about two, beginning at 2 a.m. So starting at 2 a.m., she wakes up the whole night. Some nights she stays in bed hoping to return to sleep. Other nights she watches television during the night, right? How many of you do that? Watch TV to get your minds off of sleep, right? Come on, admit it. How many of you do that? About a third of you. Thank you. Some nights she gets up for a snack, sometimes more than once. Look, how many of you do that? Aha, uh -huh. there you go, see? She feels ready for sleep right when her 6 a.m. alarm goes. That's frustrating, isn't it? 6 a.m. comes along, she's ready to go to sleep, boom, the alarm goes off, she's got to get out of bed. How would you feel the next day? Fatigued and her concentration is poor, at a minimum, right? It's a horrible thing to not sleep. So that's Anna. And it really gives us, gets us into some of the impairments associated with insomnia. We're beginning to learn more and more that insomnia is not an innocuous condition, that not sleeping can significantly impact the way you feel during a day and a bunch of other things. For example, we know that if you have insomnia, it enhances the risk of future psychiatric disorders. We're going to show you some data on this, that if you can't sleep well, it predicts the onset of future problems in mental health. People who have insomnia can't enjoy their relationships as much. Social relationships begin to suffer when people cannot sleep. Absenteeism, they don't show up to work. If you're like Anna, when it hits 6 a.m. and you just are beginning to fall asleep and the alarm rings, you're not gonna go to work that day. You may, you may stumble into work, but you're gonna think twice about going to work. Concentration, memory, ins insomniacs have difficulty with memory, remembering more recent things, but also things about themselves, their own experiences in life. The past couple of days, what did you do this morning? I can't remember. What did you do yesterday? I'm not sure. They also forget how to do things or, or, or forget. The operational memory goes by the wayside. So if they're operating a computer, for example, they have two or three windows open. They forget which window they just opened up and which one needs to be closed. Those sort of immediate recall things, they don't do well in. So task performance is impaired. Quality of life is, bit, is a problem, as you can imagine. They fall more because cognitively and motorically they're impaired. Accidents are much higher in rates. Motor vehicle crashes, as you could imagine, because they're fall, not just falling asleep, but they're not focusing, concentrating, seeing things as, as, they, as, well, as well they should. Something you may be surprised about, insomnia not only contributes to these cognitive psychiatric issues, it also contributes to physical problems. High blood pressure and diabetes. If you have insomnia for four years or longer, you have a much higher likelihood of developing high blood pressure when you never had it before, compared to those folks who don't have insomnia. It, so it contributes to peripheral vascular disease and even to it increases the probability of pain. So if you have a patient, for example, who has a pain disorder and can't sleep, the sleeplessness probably contributes to an escalation of that pain in that patient, and the opposite is true too. By improving sleep in many patients, their pain threshold begins to increase. That is, they feel less pain. It increases healthcare costs, as you can imagine. Interestingly, it increases mortality. 20 years into not sleeping, 
people have a higher mortality rate compared to those who sleep well. So insomnia is not an innocuous condition. There's, these are some meta-analytic data, that is data from many studies put together, suggesting that insomnia is a predictor of mental disorders, and this is a systematic review, and for this review, pay, the, 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 uh, the patients had to have nighttime symptoms and daytime symptoms, they had to have impairment as a result, and were followed for at least one year after, this, uh, after identification. These patients' odds ratios of having ha uh, psychiatric disorders later on were considerably high. So two or three times the rate for having depression, about three times the rate of having an anxiety disorder, alcohol abuse, and psychosis. So not sleeping predicted the onset of these problems when they did not exist at the time that they started the study. So these are normal people who cannot sleep. One year later, they have the higher rate of all of these different disorders by virtue of not sleeping. Follow? Compared to controls. Insomnia is a risk factor for suicide, believe it or not. Insomnia is strongly associated with suicidal ideation, even when controlling for hopelessness and depression. Even when you control for the depression, the presence of insomnia predicts suicide. And it's linked to death by suicide among adolescents, adults and older adults, adults, the mediator may be the sense of thwarted belongingness. You know, this is a, a term from interpersonal theory. So insomniacs often, many people often feel that they don't belong. They have a sense of not belonging and also a sense of hopelessness. And associated with this is a sense of being a burden on others. It seems that insomnia contributes to these sorts of feelings and enhances the risk of suicide. It's a very interesting phenomenon. There was a recent publication by Vaughn McCall, who's in, um, down in Georgia, and a series of patients who were treated for their insomnia with hypnotic medications. And the treatment of the insomnia diminished suicidal thoughts later on down the line, regardless of what disorder patients had. So the, I'm going to, in the next couple of slides, talk a bit about the comorbidities of insomnia that we might see in a mental health population. We talked about suicide, but quickly depression. We talked about insomnia predicting depression. It's a very weird story with depression because a lot of times depressives themselves cannot sleep. But if you look back far enough, you'll notice that it's more likely that patients had insomnia first rather than depression first. We all think, okay, you're depressed, you can't sleep. But it's the other way around. Most often, sleeplessness comes first, and then people become depressed later on. So is that depression a symptom of the on oncoming depression, uh, is that insomnia a symptom of the oncoming depression, or did the insomnia contribute to the depression? It's an important question which we have not answered very well. But the presence of insomnia in the depressed patient predicts worse outcome. Your treatment's not going to work as well in these patients if, if they have insomnia for the depression. And sleep loss in a bipolar patient can do what? It could trigger a manic episode. There were a number of data uh, gathered by patients who were being admitted who were manic or hypomanic to an inpatient unit. And they treated them with goggles and glasses which prevented light from coming into their eyes at the wrong time. So it, di it diminished their sleeplessness. The folks who had these goggles and who were sleeping better who had, had a much more rapid remission from mania after admission than the folks who did not have that. The things we do to our patients to help them can also increase their rate of insomnia, right? These are drugs which we use for depression. Uh, look at all of these, and, and, and the, the interesting, these drugs that are in blue are actually sleep friendly in this meta-analysis, and the red ones are more sleep destructive going down the line, they get more and more destructive. And the question becomes, by, by doing bad things to the sleep, do you in some way worsen the comorbidities? And we're not sure about some of these questions. Manic episodes in sleep, people who are manic have a decreased need for sleep, which is fascinating. They can go for uh, weeks, days and weeks without sleeping as much and don't seem to be that impaired during the day. And they also have other un unusual abnormalities in their polysomnogram or sleep study, such as decreased REM latency. Where have you guys seen this term before, decreased REM latency? Going into REM sleep rapidly. Do you remember, what, do you remember where you've heard that before? Depression. Interesting. Both in depression and mania, there's a decreased REM latency, right? So this decreased REM latency that is going to REM rapidly may be more of a disease-specific problem than a state-specific problem, right? It may reflect 
some sort of affective or mood abnormality as opposed to being reflective of mania or depression specifically. So maybe a biological marker uh, in terms of bipolar or even just depression in general. Anxiety disorder is pretty nonspecific. Anxiety disorder patients wake up a lot during sleep. And what's important to remember about this is that you could treat their anxiety disorder and they come back to you and say, I'm not anxious anymore. SSRI, whatever, they're not anxious anymore. They're still not going to sleep. Their sleeplessness persists even though they're not anxious when they go to bed. There's some biologic abnormality that anxiety disorders impart when it comes to a person's inability to sleep well and which probably needs to be addressed independently. Post-traumatic stress disorder, a huge problem when it comes to sleep, right? Trauma. And uh, trauma-related nightmares, that is, nightmares which focus around the trauma itself, memories of the trauma, reliving the trauma, are common in PTSD. Um, but also, a lot of times, these folks have unusual movements, vocalizations during their sleep. They enact their dreams. There, was a, there were a number of uh, uh, terrorist attacks in a Middle Eastern country many years ago um, where the survivors of that terrorist attack developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they began to reenact the whole thing during REM sleep. They would get up out of bed and enact their dreams and this, with this horrible, uh, a horrible, a horrific thing. And interestingly, the data have shown that patients who's, uh, uh, who have PTSD, rather, whose dream recollection and, and dream trauma recollection dissipates with treatment are more likely to have eventual dissipation of overall PTSD symptoms. And uh, 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 polysomnographic studies are pretty inconsistent, unfortunately, with PTSD. You really have not given us too much of a clue as to, as to, uh, uh, as to, uh, as to why this occurs. Schizophrenia, poor sleep efficiency. Uh, uh, they, 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 they have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, no distinguishing features unfortunately, in, in schizophrenia, but they all, the whole entire sleep-wake cycle seems to be affected. By the way, consider obstructive apnea. Construct, why is it important to consider obstructive sleep apnea in the psychotic patient? What's that? Wait. What do our drugs do for them, to them? Well, they help them with psychosis, but they begin to gain weight. You gain weight, you begin to develop sleep apnea. You develop apnea, Apnea wakes you up during sleep, decreases your oxygen saturation. Now, all of a sudden, you're making sleep worse. Sleep worse triggers more psychotic stuff, right? So be careful with weight. Be careful with apnea. Important to get rid of it in the psychotic patient. So, David, did you have any thoughts as, as, as to what we've discussed so far? And any, any before I go on to our second learning objective. that we heard about Anna. So, you know, what we've looked at so far, we're gonna be thinking about her complaint of having difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. And does she have some comorbid conditions for us to address? Or do we need to look primarily simply at, at her behaviors? Because, you know, uh, getting up and eating and watching TV during the night, those are not necessarily conducive to getting back to sleep very well. Right. And can really further undermine her problem. So I think we're going to have to sort out more as we learn more about her case. Right. The most apparent thing is her behavior right now, right? Because we don't know if she's yeah. depressed. We don't know if she has any comorbidities. Right. We don't know anything about her other than she gets up and eats. Yeah. She watches television with that blue light coming into her eyes and destroying her biological rhythm. Absolutely. I mean, if I, were, if I, if I could do nothing more, I would try to fix that first. Then, right. But, but we need to starting know more, place. right? And everybody knows about avoiding the blue light at night, right? Evening, leading up to bedtime. A lot, a lot of ways to try to address that. What do you do for that? Oh, well, you know, I educate people as much as I can about, first of all, you know, starting relatively early in the evening, dimming lights. You know, that there are these sleep bulbs that you can get. You know, go to your favorite online store and, you know, type in sleep bulb. All sorts of things are going to come up. There are these reddish lamps. I use one myself if you're reading at nighttime. Um, low, low color temperature, like 2700 K, um, Kelvin is one option. Then there are the glasses mm -hmm. uh, that will have blue blockers. There are the apps on all of the screens. I love those glasses. They work so well. And, uh, and just behaviorally, you know, you still, even if you're wearing the glasses and you have the app, you don't want to be sitting in front of an electronic screen for, for a long period of time. Yeah, you know what this discussion brings up, David, is that as mental health professionals, physicians, psychologists, whatever, 
when a patient comes to us and can't sleep, we're looking at all of these comorbidities these we talked about, right? Schizophrenia, bipolar mania, but just something simple like getting up in the middle of an eating and, and, and watching television, we don't think about that much. Then that right. may be 90% of the problem right there. If we can help her sleep better, then uh, maybe we can prevent weight gain and uh, you know the other, all the problems that go along with that, metabolic and uh, other sleep disorders. Thank you, we'll David. carry on. Insomnia is multifactorial. So this is something to think about as we approach the insomniac patient, right? First of all, in identifying the insomnia disorder in, is, and, and is insomnia contributing to comorbidities and problems with sleep, with functioning? The answer if it's yes, which is we, we've gone through that already then is, is insomnia associated with a comorbid condition? Psychiatric, medical, but also behavioral condition. We've got to work on that. So first, work with the comorbidity, whether it's a behavioral problem, walking, waking up at night, eating, whatever, and then, we'll, and then we'll try to also fix the insomnia. Sometimes you fix the insomnia first. But the first thing is identification. So you might say, look, we're mental health professionals, right? We identify insomnia. What are you talking about? Go talk to the family doc. They're the ones not seeing insomnia. We identify it all the time. So you know what I did? We went to an inpatient unit where insomnia is pervasive. We looked at all the charts and we did an ISI score, insomnia severity score. We identified that 74% of our patients had high criteria, diagnostic criteria for insomnia. They qualified as severe insomniacs. Guess how many of those were identified as insomnia in the inpatient charts? by psychiatrists. Guess how many? Zero. None whatsoever. Insomnia goes poorly identified in the whole realm of medical, medical science, medical disciplines. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and mental health professionals, primary care docs, we do not identify insomnia and often goes untreated, despite the fact that it's all of these effects. What is the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria? What are the diagnostic criteria for insomnia? Dissatisfaction with sleep quality or quantity, difficulty initiating sleep, falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up too early, significant distress or impairment. We talked about the impairments and what they are. Adequate opportunity to sleep, so it's not like you're sleep deprived, right? It's not like you only have three hours to sleep like I did last night. It's like you have the opportunity, but you just don't, cannot sleep even if you wanted to. Frequency of three nights per week, at least three months duration. Also, you can specify comorbidity. Remember the old, uh, DSM-3, where you had to have primary or secondary insomnia, where the disorder had to cause insomnia for it to be secondary. If the insomnia was existing by itself, it was primary. We don't do that anymore. With DSM-5, insomnia exists as a comorbidity with other disorders, because we honestly don't know. Did the other disorder get caused by the insomnia? Did the insomnia result from the other disorder? This circular relationship may exist and the direction of the arrows are unclear. So we simply say insomnia is comorbid with these other disorders. This is an, an ISI scale, insomnia severity index scale, which I would encourage all of you to go take a look at and see if you can use it in your clinical practices because it can really help you not only identify insomnia but also be able to follow how it, it across time as you treat patients. The severity level de should decrease as you in fact treat the patient. Now, we talked about the identification of insomnia, we talked about the comorbidities, we talked about the impairments. Let's talk a little bit about standard of care and some patient-specific considerations in insomnia which can guide you to identify what to do about it. So let's go back to Anna. So um, this patient, David, says that she has a stressful job, right? So that can't be a big aha for us because we all have stressful jobs and I don't know how we can't do much about that anyway, but a lot of people's stressful jobs sleep very well. Stable relationship with their partner, which is kind of nice. We don't have to worry about that. No children, I guess good. Two dogs, are those worse or better than children? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jubar says, depends on where they're sleeping. Point well taken. She exercises by walking her dogs. We were talking about this earlier. Does she do any other kind of exercise? Do the dogs drag her out of bed and that's it? Um, no alcohol, that's good, but she was a binge drinker in college. I mean, that's something to consider. Why? Well, what kind of medicines are you gonna use for her? Are you gonna make them worse? I mean, you gotta think about what's happening in this woman's life from the standpoint of maybe addictive tendencies. No medicines right now, which is kind of nice, 
and then most recent vital signs are fine. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, BMI of 29? It's a little high. Metabolic stuff, we've got to think about that too. Again, we're thinking about the entire health of this patient, not just the underlying psychiatric comorbidity. In fact, there probably isn't one. Um, right. Think she snores, but only when sleeping on her back. How, how would she know? She's just sleeping alone. We should ask her dogs, right? But, but there could be a problem there too, maybe with apnea. So there's some stuff going on here that we need to look into. David, any thoughts on this case besides that? Well, I definitely think it's worth uh, you know, giving more thought to the, the apnea issue because there's a lot of literature now showing that even very subtle sleep apnea can cause a lot of interruptions during the nighttime. You know, our pulmonary colleagues, you know, want to see big numbers in the apnea hypopnea index. They want to see, you know, um, events occurring 20, 30, 40, 50 times an hour. But there are some people down even in the upper single digits and into the teens where that degree of sleep apnea can cause a lot of insomnia symptoms that people are entirely unaware of, especially if they're sleeping alone. I ask 100% of my insomnia patients what position they sleep in. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, I try not to make it a leading question. I say, you know, do you sleep best on your side or your back or your stomach? And, and if, they're, if they're telling me they can't sleep on their back, I, that simply increases my index of suspicion of, uh, of, of obstructive sleep apnea, even very subtle, perhaps being part of the problem. It's such a common problem, isn't it? It's it so is. common. Really. Okay. Great. So we've got a lot to think about with this one. So um, look at the pattern of insomnia. Not just if you can't sleep, fall asleep or stay asleep, look at the pattern. If a person can't fall asleep, they may have delayed sleep phase disorder. If a person wakes up a lot, that's more like depression or sleep apnea, like this woman does, she wakes up a lot, right? If a person has terminal insomnia, they get up at you know, four in the morning, can't fall back to sleep, it's more likely to be an advanced sleep phase problem. So look at the pattern of it, give them a sleep log, that could indicate to you the diagnosis. And also, it could tell you what kind of sleeping pill to use later on. If you're gonna give somebody who can't stay asleep Zolpidem, it's not gonna work. You may wanna go Zolpidem CR, for example. So the pattern of insomnia over the night can tell you what kind of sleeping pill to use. The, so we've talked about Anna, we've talked about the, 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 the nature of sleep, the pattern of sleep. Finally, let's talk about the contributors to sleep in general. We talked about her bedroom environment, um, substances, she's not on any substances, but what about comorbidities, health conditions? We talked about psychiatric disorders. Are there other medical disorders we need to look at? Remember, just because we're psychiatrists doesn't mean we ought to look only for psychiatric problems in our patients with insomnia. Other things could com contribute to insomnia as well. Uh, could it be that thoughts, attitudes about, what's the, what does the insomniac think about sleep after 10 years of having insomnia? It's gonna kill me. If I don't sleep tonight, I'm gonna to die. They catastrophize. And we have to think about some of those catastrophizing thoughts. Going back to the medical conditions, these are medical conditions that insomniacs have. GI problems, chronic pain, diabetes. They, there's a higher likelihood of medical problems in insomniacs. As we get older, the, G, uh, the uh, genital urinary problems become worse. Urinary problems are the most common cause of insomnia in the elderly, and something to think about in terms of helping them. Just going over some sleep disorders uh, that David talked about a little bit, sleep apnea. Patient has, these people have obstructions that keep, that keep them from breathing properly during sleep, and they complain of very, very familiar things, poor concentration, fatigue, irritability, things that you and I think of maybe as being depression or psychiatric disorder, but like Anna, they snore, and if Anna had, had a bed partner, the bed partner may have said, oh, she stops breathing in her sleep. That's an apnea, and Anna could be having that. But it's important to ask people about that. Uh, this is something that could guide you towards whether or not somebody's a high risk for apnea. It's called a stop-bang inventory. If they, have a, if they snore, they're tired, somebody observed that thing during sleep, they have hypertension, body mass, index 35, age more than 50, a circumference of 16 inches, gender male, any three items or more, put you in a high risk for sleep apnea, send that person to a sleep laboratory for a diagnostic study. And 
And does Anna have that? She's not male. We're not sure about her circumference. She's not more than 50. Her BMI is not more. She doesn't have hypertension. We don't know about this, but she's tired and snores. So she's two out of two getting there, but we gotta be, that's what we gotta be thinking about. Restless legs. Uh, I gotta move my legs when I go to bed. I just can't sit still, right, when you go to bed. Urge to move the legs. Worsens during sleep or inactivity. And relieved by movement. You gotta get up out of bed and move around. If you don't ask about this, your patients aren't gonna tell you about it. You gotta ask. Very commonly missed. Worse in the evening. And finally, um, if there are many specific treatments for restless legs besides sleeping pills. Sleeping pills don't work for this condition very well. Uh, circadian rhythm abnormalities. I'm not gonna go over these too much, but remember the biological rhythms could be advanced, normal, or delayed. So you could have a delayed rhythm where you have a person who this is it right here, can't fall asleep until three in the morning and wakes up at noon the next day. That's a delayed rhythm that occurs more in children, younger people, and the treatment there is not a sleeping pill. It's morning bright light to help them advance those biological rhythms. In the older individuals, we can get something called advanced sleep phase, where they fall asleep at, let's say, four, I mean, six or seven o'clock in the evening, wake up at two in the morning, and have, and have insomnia. So their nighttime, light therapy may be more effective. So these circadian rhythm disorders could be very important in identifying. There's something called non-24-hour syndrome, where the one's biological rhythm is longer than at 24 hours. Imagine if you lived a 26-hour day. You would have insomnia, daytime sleepiness, in a cyclic fashion. And there are medications, by the way, now which help these people. Uh, this occurs more commonly in blind individuals, non-24-hour syndrome. So I'm not going to go over the diagnostic criteria, but they're in your handouts. Do you have handouts? Oh, they may be in your handouts. <laughs> Say again? Uh, darn it. You can't download them. But you will have them eventually, right? Okay, so your assignment is to go home and study these, these next two slides. I have to be advanced sleep phase, delayed sleep phase, but look for circadian rhythm abnormalities. I'm not going to review them in detail because, um, because of time limitation. Shift work. Do you ask your patients what kind of job do you do? Shift work is a very common problem in our society. People work overnight. They vary their sleep times a lot. Their body can't catch up. And, and these are folks that persist in difficulty. And guess what? You believe that? Increased risk for cancer and diabetes with shift work? GI difficulties, cardiovascular, yes. There was a study with nurses that showed that nurses over the course of 20 years who did shift work had a higher rate of breast cancer compared to those who didn't. Go figure, right? So it's important to look for this stuff and also to treat it because that could be really what is the cause of the sleep problem in your patient. David, I, I apologize if I took too much time, but that's the, 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 in the next phase, David will be talking a bit more about treatment considerations. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's me. Um, so, you know, we want to try to solve the problem that our patients have because they're really suffering and they're desperate about it. So we want to understand the underlying problem. And there are, you know, various... Um, uh, concepts of what the cause of insomnia is. And, and one useful perspective is right here, particularly when it comes to medications. So we know that uh, there are a lot of different neurotransmitters that are involved in wakefulness and sleep. And fortunately, there's a, there's a whole lot of redundancy among those neurotransmitters that are keeping us awake and active and functioning during the daytime. So we have what, dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin, um, acetylcholine, histamine as well. So all of those are working for us right now. I don't see anybody sleeping at the moment. Uh, maybe uh, well, somebody way back there. But, um, so those are really good. And what orchestrates all of that? The hypocretin erection system in the hypothalamus has projections into the cortex to promote wakefulness, but also back down into the brain stem to sort of coordinate the activity of all of these wake-promoting substances. So it's, it's got a very special role. And what happens with sleep is 
there is a particular area in the hypothalamus, the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus is one of them in related areas. These are very active during sleep and they have, there are projections there that go back down to these stimulating nuclei to help quiet down all of that in a very concerted way. So it's a very clever system that has evolved over time to regulate sleep and wakefulness. So all we have to do is sort of reduce the activity of the histamine and the norepinephrine and the acetylcholine and all of those, or increase the activity of the GABA or the galanin, which are involved in promotion of sleep. Sounds simple, right? Well, obviously it's not. Um, so, you know, our, our focus is on comorbid problems. And so, obviously, the first thing we want to do is think about the comorbidity and make sure that its treatment is optimized for us. And so, if we determine that somebody with insomnia has obstructive sleep apnea, well, obviously, we want to make sure that that is treated one way or another, perhaps well, with the use of CPAP. If somebody's got a major depressive uh, episode, well, we want to treat that with some antidepressant therapy, which might be a medication or it might be therapy or one of these other new strategies that's now available. Somebody's got GERD, well, a PPI or, you know, maybe a better diet would be a good idea there. Mood stabilizer for a mania, but also a life stabilizer. You know, as Carl mentioned, you know, even regulating light exposure and helping, you know, maintain regular daily rhythms can be beneficial, at least to help minimize uh, manic episodes. And clearly, we want to look at the medications that somebody is taking and make sure that, uh, that those are not doing too much damage that might be contributing to the insomnia. So the primary treatment in the literature, uh, there's a lot of support for cognitive behavioral therapy as well as for the use of various pharmacologic medications. So we want to treat the, the comorbid condition. Uh, we may choose to treat the insomnia at the same time to make more progress. So psychological and behavioral strategies, there are a lot of things that are done. They're usually combined right there at the bottom with cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI. It's very manualized type of approach. Uh, so it blends together a lot of these strategies that are shown further up. So there's a cognitive therapy to try to reframe people's maladaptive thinking about sleep and insomnia. There's usually some restriction, sleep restriction, where there are very precise rules about when someone should go to bed and when they should get up and maintaining a, a sleep diary for every two weeks and calculating the sleep efficiency and letting somebody to go to bed earlier. This is all blended in. Stimulus control therapy, the idea that you shouldn't be going to bed when you can't sleep because all that time in bed when you're awake is going to be frustrating and reinforce itself and make it more likely that it's going to happen the next night when you go to try to go to bed. You know, relaxation therapy, uh, paradoxical intention, telling someone to go to bed and try not to fall asleep. Um, and of course, sleep hygiene education is critical. Now, in the bigger picture, it tends not to get that much attention, but I think for anybody that you're treating for insomnia, whether you're using formal cognitive behavioral therapy or medications, obviously people need to be following healthy sleep habits because then whatever else you do isn't going to work very well. So, you know, we give typical advice, and this is probably a lot of what you recommend for patients as well. You know, avoid substances such as caffeine, alcohol, nicotine late in the day, um, and, you know, maybe, maybe early in the day as well for some people. Promote exercise for good quality sleep. You know, if, if people can be active throughout the daytime, there's a good chance that's going to help with their sleep. There are some studies that very specifically show that exercise routines for, you know, a um, certain amount of time, certain number of days a week can have benefits beneficial effects on sleep. A regular bedtime routine is critical to reinforce our circadian rhythms, you know, which go a long way in optimizing our ability to sleep at nighttime. You know, a comfortable bedroom environment that's a little bit cool rather than warm and uh, relatively quiet. Maybe some background white noise, but not the television, not the radio, um, and other sort of disturbing noises. Um, relatively dark as well is a good idea. Don't go to bed unless sleepy. Um, you know, you need to work on your schedule and ideally the routine is going to help promote sleepiness at your bedtime. Don't eat a large meal or drink a lot of water before bedtime. Well, that's very good advice. And most of you have probably seen some of the recent literature about um, the, the, the importance of eating early, right? You know, you have breakfast like a king and 
lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper and then not eat much leading to bedtime and increasingly the research is supporting that and I think that people are likely to sleep better if they have not eaten for a few hours. And as for fluids, well, yeah, you don't want to drink a whole lot or whatever close to bedtime and get up and pee repeatedly during the nighttime. On the other hand, you don't want to go too far the other way. I saw a woman, she was like 50 years old. She was having a miserable time with her insomnia. She was doing everything she could to try to fix it. 5 p.m. was her cutoff for any liquids, you know, up until her bedtime between 9 and 10. She was going to bed dehydrated and thirsty. Our brains are mostly made out of, yeah, you want a, a healthy functioning brain to promote healthy sleep. And so just by getting her to drink more water later in the evening was actually beneficial for her. So it's good advice. You don't want to drink too much, but then again, don't drink too little either. So there are a lot of recommendations. Uh, a lot of organizations have their guidelines. American College of Physicians, American Academy of, of Family Physicians. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy typically is the, the number one supported advice. Uh, if you're going to use medications, make it shared decision making. Um, don't use benzodiazepines in older adults, at least as your first choice, and maybe not as your second or third choice either. Avoid hypnotics as primary therapy in adults. Uh, instead, offer cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, well, of course, don't use antipsychotics first line uh, for insomnia in adults. That's really good advice, even though people don't always follow that. So people take all sorts of things. We recommend all sorts of things for people. I like to divide them in these four categories. First of all, whether or not there's a formal indication from the FDA as a sleep aid or as an insomnia medication, and also whether or not a prescription is required. So no indication, no need for uh, a prescription would be the dietary supplements, completely unregulated substances. Well, then there are the over-the-counter preparation. So these are regulated by the FDA. So you know exactly what you're getting uh, in the case of those medications. Then there are all the other things uh, that you need a prescription for that may be sedating and may or may not help with sleep and may or may not cause other problems. Don't have FDA indication, but tend to be prescribed a fair amount. And finally, there are a bunch of medications now that are approved by the FDA for treating insomnia. So thinking about these dietary supplements, uh, boy, there's an awful lot of stuff out there. And there's really no control in the, in the marketing of these substances or really even in the production of them either. I like to think of it this way. There are two broad types. There is melatonin, there's everything else. Melatonin kind of makes sense. We all make melatonin at, night, at nighttime. Melatonin has a fundamental role in the regulation of the sleep-wake cycle. So at least it kind of makes sense that under certain circumstances, maybe it'll be beneficial in helping with sleep. Certainly sometimes some people uh, do find it beneficial. Then there's all the other stuff. There's valerian, there's kava kava, there is skull cap, there is, uh, it's a long list of stuff. In fact, you know, next time you're in some store that's got a sleep aid shelf, pick up some of those and look at the ingredients because it's kind of wild. It's like the wild west out there and what they can throw together. Uh, very little data supporting the efficacy of any of these. Fortunately, there are very few safety concerns. You know, kava kava is the exception. It's banned in some countries due to uh, potential uh, liver failure. Um, like I said, none regulated by the FDA. And there are questions about the purity and the concentration and the toxicity as well. So melatonin, as I say, is, is a bit different. At least it makes sense. It is a hormone that we produce. Uh, our melatonin levels are low throughout the daytime, probably for all of you right now, melatonin is low. And it typically stays low through the daytime. And then as bedtime approaches, it gradually increases sort of plateaus during the nighttime comes down again in the morning. So it's very much driven by our biological clock and, and has a significant correlation with when we're, when we're sleeping. Meta-analyses have been done. People taking melatonin at their bedtime find that it usually doesn't do too much, at least in the clinical trials. On the other hand, if people take it earlier, it's more likely to, to have an effect. The best evidence is really for people with circadian rhythm sleep disorders because it can help stabilize the sleep-wake system and those delayed phase people sometimes shift their clock a little bit earlier. 
Over-the-counter products, so as I mentioned, these are completely regulated by the FDA for exactly what, what the substance is and how it's dosed and manufactured, how it's labeled, exactly how it's marketed. So all of that's a really good thing. You know exactly what is in those products. So they are all antihistamines. You're familiar with popular brands and there are tons of generics out there. So they can have a sedating effect. On the other hand, over time, people may become tolerant to them and sometimes take higher doses you know, they're available alone or with analgesics in those, quote, PM uh, products. Um, and of course, as a prescription, maybe they're gonna be prescribed at a higher dose. So here they are, they're just two. There's diphenhydramine and doxalamine. So look at the elimination half-lives. These are kind of long. So, you know, about eight hours or so for diphenhydramine, 10 to 12 for the, the doxalamine. <clears throat> So it's not at all uncommon for people to have some grogginess the following morning after taking these. So pharmacodynamically, they're antihistamines, so there is postsynaptic H1 receptor blockade. And so we know histamine, potent stimulating neurotransmitter blocking that has a sedating effect. Uh, the problem here is that these are kind of dirty drugs because they interact with other receptors, including the muscarinic receptor. So you have anticholinergic side effects that can be very problematic. Problematic for people that we prescribe other medications that are anticholinergic and their additive effects are older individuals as well. So you see these sorts of problems, not just the residual sedation the next morning, but confusion and delirium. I have seen patients who are floridly delirious. We had a woman, she was 72 years old. She was a retired executive secretary and she was a very sharp woman and her, she was a bit anxious. So her primary care doctor put her on some paroxetine. A few weeks later, she gets admitted to the hospital. She had an arrhythmia, she was gonna be converted. She wasn't really very sick, but in any case, she's there and she couldn't sleep very well because she was kind of anxious. So the nurses call the house staff uh, for a quote sleeper. And what do they prescribe? Diphenhydramine, how much? 50 milligrams, right, okay. After two nights of this, the psychiatry department gets the call. Uh, would you please come to a consult on this patient with new onset schizophrenia? <laughs> so you may know that paroxetine is the most anticholinergic of all of the SSRIs. So on top of that, the anticholinergic effect of the diphenhydramine put her over the edge, floridly delirious, made no sense at all. Took her several days to recover from that. I've seen people go into urinary retention, uh, just by adding on diphenhydramine, these uh, various other problems are uh, risky as well. So then the third category are those medications that are used off-label for insomnia but require a prescription. So uh, antidepressants like? Trazodone, yes. Uh, antipsychotics like? <laughs> you guys are great. <laughs> um, anxiolytics, so benzodiazepines, uh, alprazolam, clonazepam, lorazepam, stuff like that that's not indicated for the treatment of insomnia. You know, higher dose antihistamines, uh, maybe gabapentin, uh, uh, antihypertensive, clonidine, okay. Dare I ask, uh, anesthetics? Yes, it's propofol, right, okay. Okay, efficacy for insomnia is unknown for, you know, all of these medications are very well studied, but they're well studied for the indications that's in the label and not insomnia. So we don't really know efficacy, safety, there are no prescribing guidelines for them because they're not indicated. And we don't uh, really know that much about sleep effects. So, you know, it kind of might make sense in some cases if somebody's depressed and they've got insomnia, use a, use a sedating antidepressant. So there's a good argument for that. And on the other hand, there are good arguments not to do that. You have more flexibility with separate medications. Uh, antipsychotics sometimes prescribed solely for insomnia symptoms. We think it should be way, 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 way down the list, that little bit of uh, quetiapine. Um, so it's a lot of different neurotransmitters that, that do promote some degree of sedation. But, you know, there are very different risk-benefit ratio issues for somebody with and without a comorbid mental disorder. So your run-of-the-mill patients that's coming in from insomnia should not necessarily be given... Um, a problematic psychotropic. So trazodone, we all know, amitriptyline, mirtazapine, doxepin uh, throughout the years, often prescribed for, you know, for the primary indication of insomnia, even though not having a formal indication, there's the quetiapine as well. 
I just want to spend one slide on trazodone here. I'm going to say a lot more about trazodone later today. I've got a 2.45 p.m. session today uh, on insomnia, and I'll, I'll focus a lot more. Um, so I've got competition at 2.45. Uh, the competition, you can uh, come see me about sleep and insomnia, or you can um, learn about sex. So, uh, you know, a favorite Dr. Resnick is going to be talking about sex and violence. A favorite Dr. Clayton is going to be talking about sexual dysfunction. And I'm your third option, so you'll be able to take your pick. What does trazodone do? It does all this stuff. So it's really a very complex pharmacodynamics. Um, it's hard to know exactly what there might be helping sleep, and, but we can guess what some of the problems are from it. So, you know, side effects, uh, dizziness, hypotension, likely that alpha-1 receptor antagonist activity. Uh, you know, don't forget about the priapism, serotonin syndrome. The other thing to keep in mind is this, the active metabolite is MCPP, which is really not what you want your patients having high levels of throughout the daytime. And, but we'll talk about more, that more this afternoon. So transitioning now into that final category, those medications that are approved for the treatment of insomnia by the FDA. So the next few slides include all of those and various information related to them. So the first category are the benzodiazepine receptor agonist hypnotics. So they work through the GABA-A receptor complex. They enhance what GABA normally is doing with its inhibitory effect. So the first five there are the immediate release benzodiazepines. You probably recognize uh, some of those down, well, some of the brand names there. Uh, look all the way to the right and look at these elimination half-lives, like several days in some cases, which is really kind of problematic. You know, even after a single dose, but you recall from basic pharmacokinetics, if you're taking these every night, well, you get to the point where it doesn't make much difference if it's daytime or nighttime. So the next group are the non-benzodiazepine immediate release hypnotics. So these are very familiar, popular medications over the past couple decades. And they're somewhat more selective, but they still have the same fundamental mechanism of action. Big advance all the way on the right, look at those elimination half-lives. So ranging from one to one hour, two and a half hours, six to nine hours. So much less likely to cause difficulties of lingering residual sleepiness or impairment in the daytime. And the other advantage of these different half-lives is you have choices. You know, you have uh, some guidance as to whether or not you need something that lasts a little bit longer or shorter going back and forth among these. There were some alternate delivery preparations, uh, and these are all variations on Zolpidem. There's the extended release preparation that's been around for a long time. But there also are these alternate delivery products. Uh, there's an oral spray, there's a sublingual version, there's a middle of the night ultra low dose version as well. So these are all uh, potential options, although these uh, ones at the bottom really don't see it, prescribe so much. So here are the other three medications indicated for the treatment of insomnia. Um, approved by the FDA. So there's just one in each category. There is a, at least currently, there is a single melatonin receptor agonist, that is Remelteon, eight milligrams, relatively short half-life. Half-life is less, less relevant though, uh, because it has the opportunity to be active in the early part of the night to help people fall asleep. And that's you know, particularly um, you know, uh, similar to what melatonin itself does. So it could help with, with sleep onset. So doxepin, you know, doxepin's around a long time. Doxepin was approved in 1969 for the treatment of depression. Uh, prescribing guidelines go as high as 300 milligrams a day. And over a period of decades, you know, lower doses have been used to help people sleep better. Then clinical trials were done with these ultra super low doses, three and six milligrams, and they were shown to be beneficial, particularly for sleep maintenance. And there's really good literature showing the, the benefits later during the nighttime. Uh, and then most recently, we have dual orexin, <laughs> dual orexin receptor antagonist medication. Uh, there's been a whole flurry of activity uh, within this realm over the past two decades. So suvorexin um, currently is the single medication that's approved, 5, 10, 15, 20 milligrams. Uh, half-life of about 12 hours. You know, it's so interesting, uh, this whole development with the orexin medications uh, because it was just discovered so recently. 
So this chart shows all of the approved insomnia medications and exactly what their indications are according to the label. And you can see that some of them, actually a lot of them, are approved for sleep onset. Some of them also approved for sleep maintenance. One of them just for sleep maintenance, that's the low dose doxepin. Some of them just sleep onset like the Remelteon. Some of the early ones have more vague, uh, just unspecified insomnia. And more details on all of these uh, on this slide. Same medications and you can see uh, the DEA class. So all but two are Schedule IV controlled substances. The exceptions are the Remelteon, melatonin related medication, the low dose doxepin. Pregnancy category, I am um, sorry to see those going uh, away because I've sort of uh, found them very useful and especially in a categorization here. So this is very easy. The five old benzodiazepines, category X, everything else is a category C. Um, most common side effects, well, exactly what you would expect. Dizziness, sedation, sleepiness, those sorts of things, and a few um, that are associated with particular medications. So the FDA looks very closely at the use of these medications, and over the past several years, the FDA has issued these drug safety communications. There was one in 2013 about Zolpidem, and the bottom line here is they noted that women tend to metabolize it a bit more slowly, and therefore their initial dose should be lower. So instead of the 10 milligrams, uh, initial dose should be 5 milligrams. Instead of the 12.5 of the extended release, 6.25 should be that. There also was a, a drug safety communication uh, regarding the extended release preparation and caution the following morning with driving or you know, doing anything else uh, that requires um, uh, complete attention. Then the next year, 2014, the FDA issued uh, this communication about Ezobiclone. And this specifically was uh, with regard to next morning residual impairment. So as Zopiclone, one, two, and three milligrams were the doses, and usually three milligrams was the recommended starting dose for healthy adults. They said the previously recommended dose of three milligrams can cause impairment to driving skills, memory, and coordination that can last more than 11 hours after receiving an evening dose. So they said one milligram should be the starting dose and maybe work your way up, you know, with close monitoring after that. 2016 drug safety communication uh, that we're, we're all aware of, and that is combining benzodiazepines and opioid medications for obvious safety reasons for uh, potential uh, overdose and death associated with those. Ah, here, here's our patient again. Carl, come, come on up. Uh, so what are we, what's she telling us now? All right, so here's the reason she really came in. She's really frustrated about her, her sleep, and she said, I need a sleeping pill. She said she's, she's That's what desperate. she's really there for. That's what she's really there for. You know, it finally came out. She didn't want to say it right away. She wants a sleeping pill. Uh, and she goes on to say she's really been avoiding a lot of the normal, you know, non-essential social activities. Anhedonia, maybe? A bit of well, anhedonia, maybe? The social I know. withdrawal, anhedonia? It's just what I was thinking. And look yep. at this. So... She's, you know, she's got this um, long-term relationship and they've been talking about getting married, but she's been putting off plans. And it's mainly because you know, she feels kind of miserable and she's not sleeping well and doesn't really think she can do all the work to plan. But you know, being the good psychoanalyst that we are, did the other one come first? I mean, is, is, wow. this, a, is this a case of maybe not wanting to get married, uh -huh. being conflicted, and therefore sleep is a symptom? Yeah. It could be, right? It could I be. I know, I hear therapy. I'm just saying, yeah. yeah. Okay, she's discouraged, and she thinks nothing is going to help. I don't know. I think she sounds a little depressed, maybe. So is depression what's causing her insomnia? Is it going the other way? Because it's been a few years that she's been depressed. Uh, or is it a big circle, right? Yeah, I know. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So before asking for the sleeping pill, she went out and bought diphenhydramine. She bought some melatonin. Somebody gave her some cannabis. Uh, none of that seemed to help. Do you, yeah. do, do you have patients coming in telling you first, oh, yeah, I tried smoking marijuana yeah. to try to sleep better? And, you know, for half the people I see say, yeah, and it helps, and the other half say, no, it doesn't do a thing. So, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so what should we do with her at this point? Yeah, it's, it, it, this is a good case, right? Because it just, it just shows us how much psychological, psychiatric symptoms could be interwoven yeah. with sleep disturbances. And what's primary and secondary often become muddy and, and unclear. Right. So it becomes a matter of art as to which you go for first, 
second or even yeah. maybe together, right? Yes. Together? Yes. I, maybe there's a strong case to be made that you manage the entire patient in a mm -hmm. parallel fashion as opposed to saying, I start here yeah. and then I go there. Right. So, and, and as you know, data, David, there are data showing that in patients who have depression and comorbid insomnia, there's some uh, studies showing that managing both the insomnia and the depression from the get-go together right. Right. increases the likelihood of remission and uh, 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 the remission occur occurs more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So there's something yeah. to be said about managing sleep from the get-go as yeah. opposed to waiting for yeah. sleep. So we, we know that there's a lot of room for improvement with her sleep-wake habits. So that's one thing we can definitely do for her. Right. In the back of our mind, we're thinking, you know, maybe we're going to explore sleep disorder breathing, some sleep apnea. I don't know if we're ready to put her in the lab yet, but uh, at least we're going to be thinking about that as a possibility. Yeah, a home sleep study wouldn't be such a bad thing, right? Yeah. It's easy enough to do. So. Well, you know what? So here's my experience yep. with, with the home sleep studies. Most of them don't have any EEG. Right. Now, if you've got somebody with really high risk, you know, BMI of 40 and snores loudly and the bed partner says stopping breathing all the night, home sleep study can confirm that. And that's really what they're designed for. But if you've got these people with insomnia and you maybe suspect that it might be some sleep disordered breathing, but you're not quite so sure, and you get a home sleep study, and, mm -hmm. and like I said, most of them, have no EEG, so you don't even right. know when the sleep occurs. And when they calculate the AHI, the apnea hypopity index, your denominator is the whole night. And maybe that person was just asleep right. for half of the night. And so you might get a false negative if under you those circumstances. Sleep, you're, gonna, you're not going to have any apnea. It's a good point. Yeah. So, so sometimes those home sleep studies, even though they're really easy, they're, they can be very frustrating for our insomnia population. So do we give her the sleeping pill or not? What's the right answer? Yeah. Uh, well, so I can say <laughs> that if we did <laughs> want to give her something at this point, yeah. um, we, we know that she had that drinking problem. So maybe good that point. will steer us away from a benzodiazepine or non-benzodiazepine. There were two of them on your slide that showed not, not, not scheduled, right? Yeah, those right. two? I mean, That's, I'd go after those. Yeah. What do you think? Go yeah, after sure. Those two. Yeah. yeah, so we've got the, the remelteon, which is indicated just for sleep onset. That's not really her, you know, maybe she was having trouble, and maybe that would help, but it's not going to help her later during the night. Mm -hmm. Okay, that leaves us then, um, you know, with the low-dose doxepin. Right. So that might be an option. Uh, That's you know, I would, I would, so I agree with but that. But not yet, not I, yet. But right? I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't rule out the suvorexant because that right. is indicated for sleep right. onset and sleep maintenance. And even though it's schedule four, it's not based on strong evidence of, of abuse. But she also has problems getting to sleep too. So, yeah, right? right. So that could be an ideal drug for her. Yeah. yeah. So we got options yeah. to think about, yeah. but some therapy also, I think. I think therapy is a good idea too. Yeah, yeah we got to yeah. find out what she's having with this. Why she doesn't want to get married? Yeah, is it sleep or right. this, is there a, is there a, is there a next bullet point? I think there? that's it. Wow. Uh, yeah. Nice case. Okay. Nice case. Nice yeah, case. lots to think about yeah. there. And you know, it's not so unusual either. This is this is not an odd case. So. But could I just mention a commentary? Those of you having a conflict about 2:45, whether to come for this <laughs> sleep, sleep or talk sex. or the sex talk, remember. <laughs> The, the, the roadway to great sex is great sleep. Just remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. <laughs> okay. A few more slides. Clinical evidence about uh, pipeline medications. So I, I want to say first uh, that it is so interesting, this whole evolution of medications being evolved that, that, that are targeting the orexin hypercretin system. This wasn't even known about until 1998 when there were publications first announcing our understanding of the orexin system. So as I mentioned earlier, the orexin system is wake promoting and it sort of orchestrates a whole lot of activity of, of other wake promoting medications. So in 1999, it was it was discovered that people with narcolepsy were very low in their orexin activity. That kind of makes sense. If orexin promotes arousal, people with narcolepsy who are not very aroused, their levels are kind of low. And it did not take long for researchers and pharmaceutical companies to think, oh, well, maybe those people with insomnia are the opposite. They're hyper aroused. What if we can just sort of bring down their orexin level a little bit with an antagonist? So a whole lot of research started to be done. And the early medications are dual orexin receptor antagonists. There are two different postsynaptic receptors. Uh, 
And then there are some that uh, more recently that have been targeting just a single one. So Celtorexin uh, is under development right now. There are phase two studies. Um, there have been several publications. And so this medication seems to shorten uh, the latency to persistent sleep and lengthens the total sleep time and shortens WASO wake after sleep onset, improves sleep efficiency. Uh, and it's also very interestingly being investigated now as an adjunct antidepressant medication. Kind of makes sense, you know, sleep and depression. Here are some other ones. Uh, down at the bottom, I mentioned a, a lot of other pharmacodynamic actions that are being explored. But Almorexin was really the first in this category. Uh, in 2007, there was a report with this medication, and it was really the first one that demonstrated the proof of concept that an orexin antagonist can be beneficial for sleep. Its development was abandoned in 2011 for unknown reasons, presumably some sort of adverse effects. It's still sort of floating around in the literature, but um, lemborexin is the other one that has been heavily um, researched at this point. In fact, um, they have put in their application to the FDA. They may hear by the um, end of the year whether or not that is approved. So it could be available, you know, maybe early next year. So lemborexin, it's a dual orexin receptor antagonist, um, demonstrated improvement in both sleep latency and sleep continuity, sleep maintenance. Also being looked at in phase two studies for an irregular sleep-wake rhythm disorder for the insomnia that may go along with um, mild to moderate Alzheimer's. So the two studies that have been reported, there is Sunrise 1 and Sunrise 2. Sunrise 1 uh, is a one-month uh, placebo-controlled double-blind study using sleep laboratory measurements and, you know, comparing it with placebo, but also comparing it with Zolpidem, extended release. So that's really interesting to have that comparison with an active medication that we're familiar with. And then the Sunrise 2 is a 12-month um, just subjective feedback study. The first six months are placebo-controlled and um, double-blinded, and so there's a lot of data that's that's uh, evolved from that. And this just shows that uh, in, in, the, in the middle that the percentage of people who are able to bring down their insomnia severity index scale, which Carl had talked about, um, there are many more of those compared to, th to the placebo. The other slides show the benefits of sleep onset latency and uh, the WASO, wake after sleep onset, and sleep efficiency during the nighttime, and also the improvement in the, um, in the ISI. And so you can see in all of these, there are some benefits to the placebo, but both doses of the limborexin that were evaluated showed a significant improvement uh, over that period of time. Those are the end of my slides, but it's not the end of yours. <laughs> yes, we applaud you. Uh, if we have five? five minutes for questions. Those of you having questions, the microphones are open. I think we answered all the questions. I could, you know, good job. Oh, we have one question. Okay. Any thoughts on the use of Neurontin for sleep? Neurontin for sleep. Yeah, gabapentin. Yeah. Gabapentin data showed improvement in sleep maintenance primarily, some of the data, older data and um, increased interest in some of the slower waves of sleep, which, was, right. which actually made the company think about marketing it for a while as a sleep medication. Never quite made it there for a lot of other reasons, but it tends to be a, a sleep-friendly drug. It's not indicated for insomnia, but it's sleep-friendly. And those patients who you have other issues going on, like neuropathy and so on, uh, it may be a not good non-specific drug to help them both with sleep and some of the other neuropathic disorders. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in my practice, we have a lot of patients who come in who are on Ambien or Tamazepam. You know, even though they've tried other ways of trying to sleep, how long would you just keep them on these medications? Do you do it indefinitely? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So uh, were you saying, um, did I hear like clonazepam or Alprat? Clonazepam, Ambien, Lunesta. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you that I'm a bit more comfortable with longer term use if people are, are using the non-benzodiazepine hypnotics indicated, so something like Zolpidem or whether or not Zaloplon, Esazopaclone or one of those. So I'm more comfortable compared to somebody being on a regular benzodiazepine long term. 
Uh, but I think if you're monitoring somebody closely and you know they're not having adverse effects and they're functioning well during the daytime, and if you're balancing you know the the benefits versus the risks, you know I think long-term use is okay. But as I say, uh, I think something like the Zolpidem, again, you know lowest possible dose. Uh, making sure the person's doing okay in the daytime, making sure that they're not getting up and, you know, exhibiting complex sleep behaviors or having others, other adverse effects of that. Um, you know, I, I have some people that have been on, uh, say, Zolpidem or the related medications perhaps for a few years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, length, length of time shouldn't be necessarily a deterrent to having a person on a drug because these conditions we're treating are indefinite conditions, unfortunately, yeah. Can you comment on your experience of switching someone from long-term benzo to superrexent? <sighs> it's, it's a bit of a tough one because, yeah. uh, first of all, it should not be an immediate switch, right? Because the withdrawal that they get from the benzo is not going to be medicated by superrexent. So it has to be a gradual switch where you decrease one and, and put in the superrexent. This is only my own thought, but from an experiential standpoint, patients going on a superrexent don't quite have that global uh, lack of cognitive uh, awareness from beginning of the night to the end of the night. Do you follow? With the benzos, they wake up and have no recollection memory of what happened because benzos are good at you know, memory at, uh, uh, and uh, amnestic agents. Also, the, the benzos have, have a much stronger anxiolytic effect. So if the patient has comorbid anxiety, the benzos are much better, quite honestly. So if, if those are the comorbidities, patients taking Suvorexin will say, my God, I'm still kind of anxious, I'm still aware of what's going on, they may not be as happy. So you kind of have to train them in advance what to expect. Sumorexin is an excellent sleep promoting drug, but that's pretty much what it is. It's not all the other stuff that goes along with the benzo. So I'm not sure. And, and I agree with yeah. all of that and yeah. emphasize the importance of doing everything else at the same time as using a medication, and that is, you know, working on the behaviors yeah. and the bedroom routines and uh, the regularity, because, you know, none of these medications are going to fix bad sleep habits. Right. Good point. I have several uh, clients struggle with maintaining sleep, and um, I often prescribe Balsamra and the Runesta. However, they all complain that it's not really helping, um, so they want benzo. So I just don't know what's your strategy to help people to be able to maintain sleep, even though Balsamra and Runesta are the indication for maintaining sleep. So I don't know. <laughs> You said you go with Belsamra and Lunesta together? No, no just no. separately. Yeah, Sometimes separately. client combine them together. Well, Lunesta is a benzodiazepine receptor agonist, right? Yeah. So you are prescribing a benzo agonist. But what was your question? As to, oh. So what's your experience with Balsamra, basically? Because yeah. I prescribe a lot, but patient doesn't mm -hmm. really feel it's helping yeah. at all. Well, I can tell you my experience is um, yeah, it's a very appealing medication because it's very targeted in its action and avoids a lot of the other adverse effects with you know, benzodiazepine type medications. Uh, so I try it with a lot of people and you know, some of them find it very beneficial and that's great. Uh, you know, not necessarily the majority of them, uh, but, I, but I still think that if you're going to be using it, you really need to go all out with all of the other strategies to try to help with sleep. All the evening, the, the daytime routines, uh, even you know, cognitive behavioral therapy ultimately may be part of that as well. Yeah. So I, I agree that um, it's not as reliable as you know, giving you know, a, a benzodiazepine right. or a non-benzodiazepine right. medication. Uh, but when it works, it's great that it yeah. does. Yeah, the benzos are doing a lot else besides sleep. So yes. if there's a complex patient who has yeah. a lot of other stuff going on, benzos are having more, more of a panacea effect. So you have to define your effect a bit, I think with balsamic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you please um, help me uh, understand what your hesitation is with trazodone? I, I thought you said that trazodone wasn't your preferred, or is that what I heard correctly? And also, um, how, do I, how do we help clients stay asleep? Like they can begin sleeping and then they can stay asleep. Mm -hmm. it, it was tough to Two understand questions. that, but yeah. it was so, like, um, so. The trazodone, you said that that wasn't your preferred because they have a long half-life, mm -hmm. and then also, what are your um, strategies to help people stay asleep? Mm -hmm. Some people begin sleeping very well and they cannot yeah. stay asleep. Okay, so it's a big question that you ask uh, about you know how to help people get to sleep and stay asleep after that. So, 
You know, uh, there are an awful lot of uh, sleep hygiene approaches and the cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Specifically with regard to trazodone, um, it's not recommended, you know, mainly because it hasn't been evaluated for insomnia and therefore it is not indicated by the FDA for the treatment of insomnia. And, you know, the main reason is probably the studies were never done, but we recognize right. that there are a lot of potential problems with it. So there may be next morning uh, sleepiness because of the, the half-life, right. uh, but there are a lot of these other potential problems, um, QT prolongation, uh, orthostatic hypotension. Um, yeah. You've got to be more careful with it, I think. Uh, so it's a dirty drug, honestly. And, 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 but some, you know, look, we've all used trazodone, right? Sometimes yeah. it helps, helps well because we just don't understand kind of what we're treating with the insomnia. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's underlying disease processes that trazodone does help because of its multiple receptors. But to this point in time, the science has not helped us identify what those receptors are and who those patients are. So kind of got to try it. But, but again, you got to be more careful with it. Remember with men, eight out of one out of 8,000 possibility of priapism, it's not huge. Women can have it too. So a lot of, some baggage associated with it, yeah. be careful. You talked about concurrently treating depression and insomnia, and I don't know if you literally meant on a day-by-day -day basis, but do you have any concerns about drug-drug interactions with the two kind of classes, or do you have any favorite combinations? Yeah. Well, sure, you know. Um, I think whenever we're prescribing more than one medication, we are thinking about the potential for drug-drug interactions. Now, the medications for insomnia and the medications for depression include all sorts of different pharmacodynamic activities. You know, if we're giving somebody uh, a sedating antidepressant and we're also giving them a sedating hypnotic medication, well, of course, those may be problematic together. But, you know, we'd also be concerned about what other uh, pharmacokinetic interactions there might be, whether or not, you know, there's a induction um, um, of, you know, hepatic pathways or not. But, but the good news, David, right, is that these, these hypnotics in general, the ones that are labeled yeah. as hypnotics, have no, really, no meaningful pharmacokinetic interaction with any of the yeah. drugs we use for depression or psychotic disturbance, that, that, that's, that's the good news. Yeah, so it's they're not pharma, inhibitors. It's a pharmacodynamic yeah. thing. It's sometimes additive sedation, but that's pretty yeah. much it. On the other hand, things like trazodone, quetiapine, mirtazapine that we use for sleep off-label do have significant pharmacokinetic possibilities. I remember treating this guy with, with trazodone many years ago, and uh, he was a psychotic, very agitated person. I, 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 I gave him I think it was like this small dose of 50 or 75 of trazodone, 100 of trazodone. He, his sleep got worse. I started upping the dose, 250, 300. This guy was had I next to him in the emergency room. He got in with a movement disorder. He was act significantly had akathisia, significant problems. So these drugs can interact in a very strong way and produce all sorts of pro So, but yeah, these the ones that David talked about, really minimal potential for interaction. Mm -hmm. Folks, unfortunately, I have to leave. Okay. My plane leaves in an hour. So, Ooh. more than an hour. Sorry. Uh, nice to see yeah. all of you. Take care. Bye. Nice. Thank you. I, I'll continue to answer questions as long as they let me. Okay. Yeah, I have a, a quick comment and a question. Comment is I, like a lot of folks, believe that there's uh, tremendous overprescribing of medications for insomnia before we're really looking closely at everything from sleep hygiene to stimulus control and even instituting things like CBTI uh, for insomnia, which has actually been proven to be superior to medications or even medications plus CBTI has been shown to be, uh, and stimulus control has shown to be less uh, helpful than CBTI alone. So You'll get no argument from the stage on any of those points. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, actually, I have a question more along the lines of um, hypersomnia. For, for my patients who have um, narcolepsy and, say, the rare one that has a true idiopathic CNS hypersomnia, um, as far as psychostimulants go for these folks during the day, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, they kind of have to live on psychostimulants uh, as, as it goes because uh, uh, that, that's, we're not going to cure that, as we know. Um, have you run into any particular um, uh, ideas or usefulness beyond just our, our normal use of modafinil, amodafinil, uh, other medications uh, along those lines? 
Oh, well, it's a very tough population, the people who are truly hypersomnic, and, and I think it's good to differentiate them from the people with major depression where the, you know, the, the diagnostic criteria include insomnia and hypersomnia. That hypersomnia is, is not the hypersomnia that we see with obstructive sleep apnea, with narcolepsy, with idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's a very challenging population. And sometimes there's no medication uh, that's really going to solve that problem. Now for years, I've been looking forward to uh, you know, the approval of sol Riemfertal and patolasant, and wow, we're, we're now there. And uh, sol Riemfertal is in pharmacies, and uh, patolasant should be available in November, I believe. And so we have new options, and I'm very excited about seeing how they work for the population. Otherwise, you know, I've been stuck, as you have been, uh, with uh, either some formulation of methylphenidate or modafinil or modafinil or, you know, whatever amphetamines there are and just doing everything I can on top of that to, you know, scheduled naps perhaps, you know, maybe sodium oxabate in some cases. I, it is, for me, it is the most challenging population, especially when you blend in the insurance restrictions in trying to, to uh, treat somebody who does not have narcolepsy or residual sleepiness from OSA, and you get a lot of pushback. Thank you. Thank you. you. What are your thoughts about, you know, I have patients coming in who are on 1,800 milligrams of gabapentin, 300 of Cerical, and 200 of Trazodone. They really have to do the polypharmacy to get them to sleep. Yeah. Um, are we missing anything? Is there anything we should be looking out for? Oh, absolutely. I think when, when you're in that situation, and this afternoon um, in my talk, I have some examples that uh, are way beyond that. Uh, I think you know, clearly those patients are not suffering from a sedative deficiency. And, um, you know, there's just something else going on. If, you know, I, I think that typically if somebody's not responding to the usual um, prescribing guideline dosage, um, then, then, then you're missing something. In fact, you, know, you need to go back to the drawing board. In, in fact, um, I think the talk that I'm giving this afternoon is described as, uh, you know, what to do when first line treatments for insomnia fail. So I'll be exploring some of those other strategies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question kind of springboards off of that. Um, I have a lot of patients who are uninsured or very low income and seem like they are very likely to have sleep apnea, but getting like a sleep study and a CPAP just totally cost prohibitive. Is there anything I can suggest to them? Um, I've seen like some improvement or read about some improvement like bruxism mouth guards. Do you know anything about that? Well, so that's a, that's a tough situation for those people who are not able to um, participate in the standard sort of evaluation. You know, fortunately, the home sleep studies, even, even though there's a downside to those, they're a whole lot cheaper. So, you know, maybe that would be a better option, uh, like I said, if, if that can be done. Well, then you're stuck with the question if, you know, the sleep study does demonstrate significant apnea, then what are you going to do if, if they're not in a position? to get a CPAP machine. I know that there are some companies that actually make um, machines available to people. Sometimes they've turned, they've been refurbished, having been turned back in. And so there, there may be a way to get a used one. Uh, people can shop online. Um, I know people go to 1-800-CPAP uh, and find devices sometimes cheaper than they would through the, the usual directions. Now there are oral appliances, but the only ones that have good evidence are those that um, certified dentists work with to, to pull the lower jaw forward. I'm not really sure that there's evidence that the sort of mouth guards that you mentioned uh, are, are gonna solve the problem, nor are these sprays that you see advertised in the middle of the night likely to be beneficial as well. You know, one simple thing, uh, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, that is, tends to be worse when people are sleeping on their back. And so side sleeping uh, for some people is going to make a, a significant difference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question on sleep delay circadian rhythm. Uh, when you treat it, you do bright lights in the morning, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you do the 0 0.3 melatonin? All right, so there are um, so there are a number of strategies, and everybody really needs individualized treatment in terms of when they would get their light and whether or not melatonin is going to be used. And you, you, it is possible to find those ultra low doses 
of um, 300 milligrams. I've seen them on store shelves. Uh, maybe you can find them online. But I think you know th there's a flat dose response curve, so the dose doesn't matter quite so much. So probably one milligram, which you can find pretty easily. Using that hours before bedtime, bright light when the person gets up, gradually shift them early. It gets much more complicated for those people who are severely phase delayed because they may be getting dawn light relatively early in their sleep phase, which can be actually worsening the problem. And so um, there's, there's not a simple one size fits all answer. Okay. Is the liquid melatonin better than the tablets? Uh, I don't know that there's evidence that, that, that there is. Um, so I think, that, you know, whichever one happens to be easier. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things. When I went to my first uh, apnea doctor, uh, he said that there were two alternatives, the machine or they could do a little operation Yeah. back in there. I don't hear you mentioning any of that, so I didn't get it. Yeah. Well, so we didn't say too much because it's not really a, a sleep apnea talk. We, we just emphasize the fact that it's important part of the differential diagnosis of evaluating insomnia. Um, so, um, is it effective? so is, is, is uh, the operation effective? Right. So there are several. Get a little flap back there. I think we to... oh, I, I can't remember. Yeah. Well, it, so especially several years back, it would have been the the most common operation recommended. Uh -huh. But there are there are variations. There's some other more aggressive types of surgeries that sometimes uh, are done. You know, um, we don't think of surgery as a first-line approach so much because uh, people tend to do well with the CPAP or, or some other right. positive airway pressure device. I and, like um, that guy anyway. How about uh, sunglasses? I know the blue is better. Is there any help? It's ironically, I got to thinking, oh, you know, it makes it dark. Right? Yeah. So it really depends on, on the product right. and, and right. when. So you really want to be blocking out the blue right. in the late in the day. Now, in the morning, you want to get sunshine usually, and so the, sun, the sunglasses probably wouldn't be a great idea then, you know, right. other than for safety purposes while well, driving. I, I notice that when I'm driving long distances and, you know, you think you can't stay awake, and then once that sun pops up, all of a sudden you're awake. Uh, much better anyway. <laughs> well, we, we depend on the sunshine for Thank our sleep-wake cycle. Thank you. Hi, I was just wondering for um, someone who has insomnia and they can't uh, fall asleep and you say try for 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then get up, um, how long should they get up and what should they do when they get up? And then if they go back to bed and they still can't fall asleep for another 20 minutes, do you say get up again? Right. So for more details, just look for stimulus control therapy because there are uh, clear guidelines for what to do. But the basic idea is that if you, you know, go to bed when you're sleepy, if, you know, from my, from my point of view, if you get in bed and you are sort of rattled about the fact that you're not falling asleep, then you ought to be get, getting out of bed right away. But the usual guidelines say about 20 minutes and go do something else. So clearly you don't want to do something that needs a lot of light. And you don't want to do something, you don't want to start baking bread that's going to keep you busy for the next few hours. So some activity with relatively dim light that you can stop doing when you can you feel like you might be able to fall asleep again. And at least in the beginning, you may need to do that several times during the night. Uh, and then eventually over time, um, at least the literature suggests that the stimulus control therapy will lead to quicker sleep onset and fewer awakenings during the night. It's true. 